something, 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 something. I can't ever remember the words to that song. Oh, hey, everybody. Hey, uh, welcome to the gathering place. My name is Daniel Davenport, and you are here with us online. Good to be with you. It is Christmas season, or what I like to refer to as the season of Advent. And so what a great place to be today. I have a message that I hope is going to encourage you uh, and inspire you. But before we do that, I just want to pray for God's blessing on you, that whatever you're going through right now, that today you would receive hope from him, that he would strengthen you, that he would reveal himself to you, that he would show that he is Emmanuel, God with us, God with you. Well, I'm sitting here in our lobby today, our welcome center at the Gathering Place campus, and it's all decorated to a degree here in the, in the uh, church, and we are ready to celebrate who Jesus is. And so if you have not ever come out to visit us, I'd love to have you. We are here every Sunday, 9.30 a.m. in person. Uh, I would love to greet you, meet you, and get to know you. And if there's anything that we can do to partner with you this season of life, we would love to do that as well. If you want to know more about our church, you can go to our website, tgpchurch.com. That's tgpchurch.com. should be right here or here on the screen. Uh, but you will find out what's happening around here at our website. And that's a pl great place to uh, get in contact with us as well. Hey, I, I want you to do this with me. Would you pull out your Bible and would you hold it up and remind yourself that this is no ordinary book. Let's say this out loud and loudly together right where you're at in your home. Let's say, this is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. All right, well, hey, I got a question for you. Here we are in a season where we need hope, right? We talk about hope. We say, hold on to hope. But I want to ask you, is hope a good thing or a bad thing? Now, I know that might sound like a strange question because most of us would probably think and say that hope is a good thing. But did you know that for centuries there's been a debate as to whether hope is a good thing or not. And there are many people who would say hope's actually not a good thing. In fact, if you look back, oh, I think around the, uh, the 8th century BC, there's this Greek god, Greek guy, not Greek god. He was a Greek guy writing about Greek gods. And he, he wrote this uh, story here, and, and it's about Pandora. Do you guys know who Pandora is? No, I don't mean like Pandora the the music station online, and I don't mean Pandora like the, like the jewelry. What I'm referring to is Pandora, uh, the, the mythical god, goddess, princess, lady that was created. And uh, she was created to basically as a punishment to mankind. Now there's a whole lot more to the story and I don't know a whole lot about uh, the Greek myths. Uh, I don't follow them that closely. They're kind of interesting actually, some of them. But here's how the story goes. Basically, she was created and she was given a jar. And in that jar were all the evils, all the evils. And so all the different gods, they gave gifts to her. But in this jar, they put all evil things in that jar and they sent her to earth. She got married. Here they are going about their business one day and then curiosity killed the cat. Well, it wasn't really the cat, but what happened was Pandora took her jar. Now you've heard about it like Pandora's box. It's not really how the story goes. It's Pandora's jar. Pandora had a jar and out of curiosity, she opens up the jar to look inside. And when she opens up the jar, all the evils that the gods had placed in the jar, they all escaped. And that's what caused evil in the world as we know it. Except for one evil that was placed in there did not escape because she saw this stuff coming out and she quickly shut the jar. Now, what was left in there? Hope. Hope was not something that was given as a blessing or as a virtue in this story. Hope was actually an evil. Now, there are a lot of people who debated as to the meaning of this story. They said, well, maybe 
the evil or the bad thing was that hope was in the jar and it was inaccessible to mankind when all these other evils were released, all the hardships, all the troubles and tribulations that people go through. They had to go through all of this, but they couldn't access hope. Other people said, no, hope was one of the evils uh, that were given because hope would set people up for false expectation so that while they're going through hardships in life, they would have this hope only to be disappointed. And that's why hope was looked at as an evil. Now, that kind of thinking has led people like, you know, the, the German philosopher Frederick Nietzsche. He, he, he was a philosopher and just a pretty depressed guy who really was hopeless and, and gloomy in, in just about every aspect of life. Well, he said this about hope. He said, hope in reality is the worst of all evils because it prolongs the torments of man. It prolongs the torments of man. So in other words, instead of just facing the fact that life stinks and you're going through hard things, when you have hope, it causes you to imagine that it's going to get better, but it's not going to get better. This is a hope sucker, by the way. This guy, he had a cloud over his head all the time. He must have always thought that things were going to get worse and worse. And, and there are many people who think that way. And of course, he's somebody who was, would be considered an atheist, an evolutionist. And the reality is typically people who have uh, no God have no hope. So here's somebody who would say that hope, it just, it just gets your mind off the pain that, that we experience in life. And that's all life really is, is nothing but suffering. So you might as well grin and bear it. Well, I could imagine that maybe he is taking a perspective that could be found in the Bible in regards to hope when hope is deferred. Now, Look in your Bible with me at Roman or Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. It makes the heart sick. But when the desire or that which you are anticipating or hoping for, when it comes, it's a tree of life. So hope that is deferred does make the heart sick. So if you're going through something hard and you have an expectation or an anticipation that things are going to turn around and they don't, you know what that does? It makes you feel terrible. In fact, it's sort of like Nietzsche or however you would say his name, Eeyore, we'll call him Eeyore. He's saying, don't get your hopes up because you're just going to be disappointed. That's what the scripture is saying. When you have your hopes up and it doesn't come to pass or it's pushed away from you, it's taken out of your reach, it makes the heart sick. I think that there's probably a lot of people that are going through this cycle right now, don't you? Where we are hoping that things are getting better. We're hoping that uh, people, the risk for, for uh, coronavirus, that, that it, it's getting less, and we start to feel like we're getting in a better place, but the news just keeps telling us, no, no, it's getting worse. We hope that we're going to be able to open back up, kids get back to school, that I'm going to be able to see people and, and embrace them freely, that I'm going to be able to walk into stores and, and go and, and, and support the local businesses and, and maybe even have a job, you know, or get my job back. We have this hope and yet, as we get closer to that, it seems like the rug is pulled out from underneath our feet. And what can happen in a situation like that is that hope keeps getting deferred or it keeps getting pushed off. And on the inside, oh, the heart gets sick. And as a result of that, when we lose hope, we start to think terrible thoughts. We start to have a very dim outlook on the future or on our purpose or, or what, what are we doing? And, and as a result of that, we, we can end up isolating even further. And when we're isolating, we don't get in the right mind. The Bible says that, that the man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all wise counsel. What does that mean? It means you get off on your own and you start thinking crazy. And you start to think that the way you see it is the way it is. And when other people even want to speak hope and life into you, 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 want, you don't want anything to do with it. Well, what happens? Isolation it plays evil games with us. And sometimes when hope is deferred, 
we end up further isolating. And of course, we're in an environment where we are told unwisely to isolate. Whatever you do, I don't care what your condition is, your situation, don't isolate. Even if you need to be physically separate for your own health or the health of others, don't isolate yourself. Be diligent to stay in contact with other people. On the phone, drive by, wave at them through the window, get on Zoom, do whatever you can, wear your mask, go out, do what you need to do so that you are not isolated, even if you need to be protected. Because what will happen is at that isolation will set in and you'll start to feel terrible about yourself. And when you get in that situation where you become vulnerable to the enemy, all of that can be a result of losing hope. When hope is deferred, the heart is sick. But when it's fulfilled, it becomes a tree of life. And so the scripture isn't saying that hope is bad at all. What it's saying is when hope isn't fulfilled, that's no good. But when hope is fulfilled, desire does come, it brings life to us. And I think that's the kind of hope that we as believers need to lay hold of. In fact, we're in this season where we're reminded of hope right now. Christmas tells us that hope lives, hope came, hope was not deferred any longer. But in that manger, when God became flesh and dwelt among us, starting as a baby, we know, oh, hope has given us life. Hope has given us a future. Now, we know it's Christmas season, but we call it Advent season. Advent isn't just uh, a religious word. Advent, it, it means this. It means the coming or arrival. And so for Christians, especially during this season, we, we celebrate the first coming of Jesus. We celebrate that. We honor that. We remember it. We take it to heart. We, uh, we, we take great joy in that. However, we also celebrate or anticipate his second coming. This is what it is. Jesus first came in humility, but we await his second coming when he comes in glory. And so we're looking towards this during Advent season, the coming or the arrival of Jesus, the second coming. Now, I'll tell you this. This is the time for remembering. It's a time for rejoicing. It's a time for waiting. It's a time for watching. It's a time for reflecting. All of that creates hope on the inside. Now, we have these in, this in-between period. I always think of life like this. You know, you, you, it's peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, right? And so there, there's the, the, the joy fulfilled, and then there's the time as we're hoping and waiting for the next promise to be fulfilled or the joy to be complete. And then we go through these seasons. We are in a season like that right now where we uh, may very well be in the valley and not at the peak, right? We're not at the mountaintop. But you know something about mountaintops? Mountaintops have great views. Mountaintops make you feel like, oh, I've accomplished. I feel strong. But if you've ever go to a mountain at the top of the mountain, you realize all the fruit, it's grown down here in the valley. It's grown in the lowlands. And the fruit of your life, that which will sustain you to get you back up the mountain, that is developed in these seasons in the valleys. And so understand this, God is with you. He's walking through this with you. And you should be walking through this with other people because they're willing to walk through it with you. But as you walk through this, something is being developed. And if you will hold on to hope, then you're, you're going to get to that next season. There's always something that God has in store for you. Now, we are people of hope. Throughout the scripture, it talks to us about hope. In Titus 2.13, it says that we are looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what we're looking for. So understand this about hope. For us, the believer, our hope isn't only in a desired outcome, but our hope is in a person. Our hope is in a person. It's the person, Jesus Christ. And so this is why when we talk about hope, we're not talking about that, that hope that says, I hope things get better. I just hope things turn around. But we don't really have any evidence or reason for it other than we would rather have that situation than this situation. 
No, when we talk about hope, we talk about a person. We talk about a hope that we look to. His name is Jesus. And with that, he has promised us eternal life. He's promised us eternal life. It's the eternal life is this abundant life that God has. It's the God quality of life that begins now. So that you're not just waiting for life in heaven, but you begin to experience life with God now. That's what we talk about when we talk about eternal life. Now, Romans 8.24 says, we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one hope for that which he still sees? And that makes sense, right? Why would you be hoping for something to be given to you if it's already in your hand? That's not hope. He's saying, we have hope. We're people of hope. But we, we hope for something that we don't quite see yet. Verse 25, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. We're waiting for that which we hope for with patience. And that's the thing about hope. You have to maintain it with patience. Patience is what carries our hope along. Patience is what really brings hope to the top. If you lose your perseverance or your patience, it's easy to drop or let go of hope. And so we don't just stop right there with, the, uh, with, with hope for eternal life, uh, which we do have. You know, Titus 1-2 says, we have hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, be promised before time began. So hope belongs to us. It's a promise. Eternal life belongs to us. That's a promise. And so when we realize, again, we're not just hoping that we're going to get eternal life. We have hope because we have eternal life promised to us. So when, when we talk about hope, we're not just saying, I hope things turn around or I hope the future is better than the present or the past. When we talk about hope, we say we know, we are confident, we are absolutely sure that our future that God has for us is better than our present. We are absolutely sure that God has life in store for us. It's a promise that he's made and he cannot lie. Now look at 1 Peter 1.13 with me. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So again, we have hope. We have a living hope though. We have hope in the person, the resurrected person of Jesus Christ. So new life, fresh life, full life, this is what God has in store for us. This is why when people uh, begin to lose hope, it's because they're only focused on the current situation. They're only focused on the hardships. They're only focused on the difficulties of today. They might even see the pattern of things just not looking like they're turning around at all. And they begin to get their eyes on that. And their eyes aren't on the unseen. And they're not on the person of Jesus Christ. And so, of course, anybody's going to lose hope in that situation. For us, though, hope is an anchor to the soul, as Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says. It says, we have this hope as an anchor to our soul, which allows us to enter in to the presence of God. It allows us to enter into the presence of God. Hope creates this anticipation and expectation that causes you not to draw back from God or give up on God, but to press into the Lord, to draw near to him. This is the kind of hope that God has called us to. Now, when we think about this hope and why it's so important, think about why it's so important to you and me right now, hope carries us through the hard times. So it doesn't just set our eyes on the future, but again, it keeps us going through the present. Look in Romans chapter chapter 5 with me, verse 3 through 5. It says, not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance. 
and perseverance, character, and character hope. Let me pause on that. What are tribulations? Tribulations are hard times. And so Paul is saying, man, we celebrate during hard times. When we're going through difficult times, for us as believers, we know that those hard times are actually working on our behalf. Now, let me pause for a second. The hard time isn't given to you by God to teach you something. The hard time is the time that you're going through and you have to determine, I'm, I'm going to learn something from this. <laughs> Understand the difference. Because some people will look at a hard time given to them and say, you say, this is given to me by God to teach me something. Well, let me tell you something. You can read your Bible and learn something from God. You can read a book and learn something from God. You can just determine to learn something from someone else's example, from their experience. You can learn something by God. God, God could give you that to, to teach it to you. He doesn't have to give you a hard time. Hard times come without God's help, in other words. You get into hard times on your own. Other people call, cause hard times for you. It's just the, the reality that we live in. But what do we have to do? We have to determine in the midst of that, I'm going to learn, I'm going to grow. It's going to develop in me a perseverance, a, a, a patience, and that patience, as I go through these difficult times, I'm going to develop character. What does that mean? This character that God is shaping is the type of character that causes me to see the big picture. It causes me to uh, understand that God is still faithful, that I have to remain faithful. This is the kind of character that causes me to walk in humility, to know I don't have all the answers, that I can't fix everything or change everything myself, that I need to, uh, you know, uh, to honor others, prefer others. It's that kind of character that means I need to love and serve and uh, cherish other people and be generous with other people. That's the kind of character these hard times develop on the inside of us. And that character, it develops something. It develops hope. I think that hard times produce patience that produces character, that produces hope. That, that hope right there comes alive on the inside because now we have a pattern where we look back at other hard times when we patiently endured what it developed on the inside of us and we saw God come through and we have hope again. So knowing that in this situation that may be difficult or trying, it may be lasting way longer than I want it to, I know this, I can look back and say, God's been faithful every time. He has never failed me. He's never backed off. He's never given up on me. And so because of that, I have hope that in this situation as well, things are gonna turn around. Now, I know this is how it's worked for me, I know that I've gotten myself into all kinds of trouble. I've, I'm, you know, I'm young. I'm super young still. Uh, don't let the gray hairs fool you. I, I, I have my barber put those in there when he, he plucks all this other stuff out to make me look older because then I feel like I could earn a little bit more respect that way. But I, I've been around a little bit, and I know this, that throughout my life, through the ups and downs, God has always been there and he's always pulled me through. I have some scars. I have, I've made some decisions that I wish I didn't make. Uh, there are times where it didn't come out like I anticipated that it would, but yet I look back and I see the faithfulness of God. And so it makes me think that in the situation I fi find myself in today and however I find myself tomorrow, God is going to be faithful. That's just how he is. Now, verse 5 of that same passage says, Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you this. What are you hoping for? Maybe let's look at this situation you're in now. In this season, what are you hoping for for your family? What are you hoping for for yourself? Here's another question. Who are you placing your hope in? Are you placing your hope in the government turning things around, your employer turning things around? Are you placing your hope in your own ability? Or are you placing your hope in the, the God who is uh, named above every other name, Jesus? 
Are you placing your hope in the one who not only will do some things in the future, but has done something that changed everything in the past when he came and gave his life on the cross? This is the one we wait eagerly for with Advent in mind, the coming, the arrival of Jesus Christ. I hope that you would take some time during this season to press pause on Netflix, press pause on all the activity, and that you would, you would maybe light your candle and take time with your family or even by yourself, and that you would reflect on uh, your expectations and your hope for uh, this season of your life, and that you would invite God in to reveal himself and show himself strong on your behalf. What's going to happen? The love of God is going to be poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And I hope that's what your experience is. If there's anything we can do to pray with you, come, along your, uh, come alongside of you and to uh, encourage you during this season, let us know. Again, if we haven't met you in person, come on out to the gathering place Sunday mornings at 930 at our Folsom campus. Uh, otherwise, I'll be right back here in your screen next week helping you live out your faith more than Sunday. God bless you.